Well, welcome, uh, Dr. Gavin Ashenden. It's a joy. We, your voice sounds very familiar, um, having tuned into a few of your Facebook uh, services a number of years ago. I know that you did that. Maybe we can talk about that in a minute. But where, where are you? Are you? Are you in Scotland, did you say? No, I'm in Normandy. Um, I'm, oh, Normandy. I'm halfway between Mont Saint-Michel and Caen. Oh, so okay. the bottom of the, of the peninsula, um, mm -hmm. about half an hour from the Norman Normandy beaches. Okay, wow. Um, and you live normally? Well, I, I, <laughs> I normally live in Shropshire, at least my, that's where my, uh, my home is, uh, near to my wife's parents. But um, ab about 10 years ago, we, we thought that God was saying, take some of the money. We had a house and we, we, we sold it to move. And with part of it, we bought a small house in Shropshire. And we thought the Lord was saying, buy a place in Normandy, I have some work to do. This, this came not through us personally, but through some praying, praying friends we have as well. Mm -hmm. So we said we can't see why, but then I came across a, a, a place with two houses and a chapel in the garden. Oh, wow. So um, uh, next to a river. And so, so and the, the chapel, some places are particularly, um, so, Depending on who one's audience is, once you, you know the word changes. You know, okay. there's a sense of presence. They're blessed. Uh, yeah. Yeah. I I thought I, I I mean I've never seen an angel in my life, but I thought I heard two angels say, "Stop gabbling and slow down in your prayers, or we can't join with you." When I went into so you know odd things like that. Anyway, here we are, mm -hmm. and and the plan I think now, <laughs> so seven or eight years later, it it looks like I'm limbering up to do a kind of under the radar retreat center. Um, well, this is this is that's a fascinating, uh, unexpected. Um, I would love. To, I mean, you're just the back. I always find it funny when you when you meet people and you can see their backdrop. It just is a little window, isn't it, into their lives and what's going on. Um, let me let me just introduce you because um, I'd love to chat about that perhaps as we get get hmm. into the conversation. But we've got we, we, you and I. Have, um, it's 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 a real joy to meet you because, as I say, I've I've tracked with with your public presence for a number of years now. I know we've connected a little bit um for i'm just thinking partly of people that don't know you from adam um yeah. i want to just just give you a couple of bullet points so you, your your official title these days is oh, i don't have one do you not oh, just just well, just doctor i mean Do you'll have a Gavin ashenden that's what i meant Adeline. as, as opposed yeah. as opposed to most highly reverend whatever <laughs> <laughs> all that all that that ridiculous faradango that that well, uh, it yeah. still exists doesn't it uh, it does so you're you're british catholic layman that's what you're doing these days yeah former, former priest of the church of england and former continuing anglican bishop and mm. as, as, as i'm sure you would be a millionaire if you'd had a pound for every time this was said an honorary chaplain to the queen from 20 2008 to 2017 so it, it's a it's a in a sense a, a glittering i don't want to be kind of um crass but it is quite a um an interesting um, summary on Wikipedia, shall we say. Um, and we're connecting today really to do with your juncture, I think from 2017 to, to today. And again, thinking about people, I'm sure most people will, will have caught wind of something, but for, for maybe people in America or overseas who don't know that you were, again, you were a former priest in the Church of England, 2017, Sorry to do this so quickly, but it's important to get mm. to the conversation and the context is key. So to, you, you kind of essentially converted from Anglicanism to Catholicism in 2019, December 2019, having had this initial um, hiatus uh, from the Anglican Church because of an incident in Glasgow in 2017 or thereabouts. Um, do you want to just quickly talk about that? What just just about the specific part at which you left the Church of England because you became convinced? And this is why I was drawn to you. This was a number of years ago, and I thought, brilliant, a father figure in his sixties. I should have said fifties, just to compliment you. No, sixties, um, nearly seventies. Okay. <laughs> um, and he gets it. He gets it. And he's left the Anglican Church, which is apostate in our opinion, the yeah. chaos in the <clears> sense of the of the chaos of the church. So do you want to just talk about that initial briefly, and then we'll come to the, the nuts and bolts of our conversation today about Catholicism? Yeah, I think so. So can I say thank you, first of all, for he gets it? Because that, you know, for those people who are listening to us, <clears throat> that that's the key introduction. We're talking to people who get it as people who get it. 
And what is it we've got? So let me just throw in a couple of things. As a law student, I had an evangelical conversion in 1975. I gave my life to Jesus at 8.15 on the 3rd of March, 1975, and haven't looked back. Uh, I was involved in the charismatic renewal, um, uh, prophecy, tongues, building the body of Christ, the gifts of the spirit. Uh, got involved with, after, after David Watson and the uh, Colin Buchanan and, and, and um, who was that Miles man who became an Orthodox priest? Michael Harper. Uh, moved on to David Wimber, loved Wimber, got a bit freaked out by the Toronto blessing, wasn't quite sure what to make of it, still not quite no. sure. Um, found myself involved with both Catholicism and Orthodoxy and was astonished at the roots. So the, the charismatic in me was looking for, for kind of deep wells of the Holy Spirit mm -hmm. and was surprised when I discovered to, to an evangelical Anglican that they were hidden in these two older siblings in the faith um I, I i did a i did a few degrees i got a phd and then spent the, the proportion of my life 25 years teaching at our most secular university i went wrong i <laughs> i got seduced by carl gustav jung uh, and joined the wrong side of the sexuality team mainly because i want i had lots of gay students i wanted to look after i wanted to bring them to jesus and I thought, a bit like HTB thinks now, if we just accept their sexuality as they are, perhaps we can do the evangelism thing and mm -hmm. take them further on the path towards Christ before they jump us off because they're cross about being rejected yeah. in terms of their sexual identity. Mm -hmm. um, they would say that was going fine until, until the devil attacked me. I had some, some really very serious satanic attacks and I'd had them at the beginning. Um, when I whenever when I started line up to give my testimony in churches in 1975 and then 1976, the devil was very mean to me, and it is astonishing to me that I forgot about him. Um, but I did. I, I, you know, the, the the life in the spirit is a very is not the same thing as life in the brain or life in the body. And things things can happen. Occlusions can take place. We can go blind. <laughs> <laughs> we, we can we can stop hearing stop seeing stop listening the fact that you've had an experience mm -hmm. or two doesn't mean that you remain uh at the center of the of the kind of spiritual target so to speak mm -hmm. and mm -hmm. uh, although i never stopped wanting to bring people to jesus i lost the plot i stopped getting it effectively okay but 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 ha having the, the thing about the university was just to, to finish the sentence um so this doesn't become a monologue yeah i i I was fully immersed in the progressive, pro the progressive secular project. You couldn't have right, been. When, when was that? When until what point? Eighty nine to two thousand and twelve. Mm -hmm. And and two things happened. One is uh, I discovered that the whole narrative we were being sold sexual identity on was false. That that actually uh, the, the lies of people who were engaged in the gay subculture were a terrible and, and wounded mess. And what we were being told in public by the media and by the psychologists and by the theologians was all untrue. And the other thing that I discovered was that my Muslim colleagues, I lectured in Islam, I taught postgraduate courses in monotheism, that, my, that actually my Muslim colleagues were looking forward practically to the day when Britain became an Islamic Republic. And there was a kind of moment when we had a very honest and frank conversation and my jaw absolutely dropped. It was about 2002. Mm -hmm. So, so two things happened to me. I, I discovered that the way in which we were dealing with Islam in public was, again, a, a false narrative. And the way we're dealing with sexuality was a false narrative. Mm -hmm. And then I was being attacked by the devil. So the combination of these three things mm -hmm. <clears throat> drove me essentially back to the center of the target, mm -hmm. back to my roots. Mm -hmm. and, and about, I guess about 2010, I saw what was happening. I saw that our freedom of speech, our freedom to evangelize, our freedom to witness was going to be seriously curtailed. I saw that we were going to go head to head with Islam on the one hand and head to head, well, let's, let's say with Marx on the other. <clears throat> if we say the whole progress, one of the simplest ways of dealing with this is we've got three characters in our culture. We've got Jesus, Muhammad, and Marx. You know, Marx will give the whole progressive sexual identity, Black Lives Matter, mm -hmm. um, you know, that, whole, that whole package. And, and, and the question is, how are these three, mm -hmm. how are the followers of these three mm -hmm. seminal figures interacting and what's going to happen in the next 20 years? I don't, I don't want to steal your title. Well, that is a brilliant title um, and it, it would hopefully pique a bit of interest. Um, 
I think I think it's important before we get into that, and I'm not. I'm not wanting to kind of conform to pressure here to produce a, co a podcast in 20 minutes. So if we go longer into an hour, even I don't care. I, wa I want to get, I want to have a quality conversation. And again, as you've said, for people who get it, you know, sitting and listening to a conversation like this should be a joy, not a chore. Mm. Um, I want, I want to just, this is the thing that I've had in my mind since I knew we were going to be talking. That I wanted to tee up because you, in your, one of your emails to me, you had talked about having a charitable conversation. Now, um, which is which is what we want to do, and I want to extend both father. You know, look as a father figure. I want to extend respect on that level. I want to extend respect on the on the professional level. That's a horrible word, but you know what I mean. Mm -hmm. um, but this is the thought that I've had in mind, and I want I want us to have a charitable conversation this morning about all of these things. But I, I also want it to be frank, yep. because what we're talking about is infinitely important. Infinitely is not a. It, it, literally infinitely let, let's be really frank let, let's let's speak let, let's do, let, let, head oh, to to, head. totally totally okay. um but this is the reason why um i had a conversation i wanted to share this with you and again for folk who might not know this i had a conversation um maybe three or four months ago towards the beginning of the year and we'd wanted to look at the life of dietrich bonhoeffer because of the obvious parallels you just mentioned cultural marxism mm. there um between today and uh, you know Second World War Germany basically and Hitler and so on and what have you and so I reached out and I, I thought brilliant we've connected with the former president of the International Bonhoeffer Society praise God we're going to have a quality podcast series we're going to draw on on this this chap's wisdom and what met this guy lovely lovely chap you know like just immediately lovable very kind of um, much like yourself and i'm not during the conversations we had we, we planned to do two or three podcasts so it was a mini series and i just began to feel there was something we weren't we weren't connecting you know yeah. and it turns out that this this chap is a universalist um he believes that i was a heretic because i believed in jesus exclusive exclusivity mm -hmm. basically and yeah, so the, the net result of this is that a, a, a chap, a father figure in that same kind of bracket, who was presumably an expert on Dietrich Bonhoeffer, who is generally regarded as being solid. Um, and yet, if you read Banner of Truth's website about Dietrich Bonhoeffer, there is a serious question mark over his theology. Now, you might say, well, he was only 28 before he died. There is some grace to be given to him now as being a young man in his formative years or whatever. Um, D Desiring God, John Piper, you know, his book on marriage is really um, based on Dietrich Bonhoeffer's uh, quotes and so forth. So my point is simply this, that I don't, I wasn't, in the end, I couldn't use the podcast, Gavin, because mm -hmm. this chap, I, he didn't believe what Jesus said in John 14 about being the exclusive way to the Father. Yeah. And so I, I'm not interested in producing podcasts that are pleasant. I'm interested in producing pon podcasts that help to breach the chaos of the church. Yeah. And hence, hence this kind of frank, but also respectful tone. So I, what I'm interested in is, could you just explain briefly in bullet form in terms of this shift in 2017, where the integrity of the, of the, of the word of God was crucial. You couldn't put up with the church of England because the Quran was being read in a church in Glasgow and Jesus divinity was being denied. And then we've come through to 2019 where you feel like your homecoming so to be is, is into the back to the catholic church um i've got some concerns about that i've got some questions for you and <clears throat> i've been quite disturbed to be honest about this so i'm hoping that at least clarity will emerge uh -huh. could, you, could, could, could you just maybe talk about 2017 and 2019 because that to, to the face value doesn't look reconcilable so you're right. Um, one of the things that affects the way we look at the, the, the target, the, the goal on the horizon, is, is the place on the compass where we're looking at it from. So to use that analogy, uh, you know, the, the, from, from the place we're looking at it from is going to have its own, if you like, sort of angular emphases. And maybe one of the things we need to do, uh, certainly as Christians, is, is to look, at least prophetically, uh, uh, where God's bringing us to from different perspectives. And, and uh, so I've I partly done that. That may sound a bit obtruse, but I'll try and explain in a moment. So essentially the goal is um, 
faith in the West has been betrayed. The churches have given up believing. They've given up believing in the Bible as the, as the authoritative word of God. They've given up discipleship. Uh, and we're entering a time of, I think, I think it's two Thessalonians where Paul talks about it, where people appear to have gone mad. You, you mean, you can't even deal, talk to them rationally anymore. There is this, uh, it, it's a very strange experience. Um, my, I, I said to the Lord when I was converted, where do you want me? And he seemed to say, um, I, you know, to condense it, I would say, he spoke to me and said the Church of England. Mm -hmm. um, then the Church of England began to apostatize. And it was quite clear, I, I guess I got, I got that probably from the late 80s, because essentially what the church was doing was buying into secular philosophy on the grounds that it wanted to keep up with its audience. So that was, that's where the whole... Like, H, like, like HTB. Yes, that's right. I mean, that's where that's where swallowing feminism comes in. You know, feminism has a number of ways we need to define it. There's mm -hmm. good bits to feminism. There's, there's there's neutral bits. There's bad bits. So you know, we have to be careful in what, how we describe these things. But essentially, what the church did unthinkingly and and simply politically and sociologically was it brought into feminism in the late eighties. So this could have been a good thing if feminism had been benign and and was capable of meshing with Christianity. If, if feminism was capable of being saved, let's say. Uh, this was, would have been a good thing. But it turns out feminism was not only not capable of being saved, but actually was batting for the wrong team completely. So this was a really serious error to make, and they should have gone more slowly, thought about it, and prayed about it, but they made it. Having taken the bait of feminism, they've then been pulled right through the whole progressive agenda of, of uh, and every single part of it, um, whether it's it's gay marriage, third third wave feminism, um, gender dysphoria and what's coming, of course, which is going to be paedophilia. Mm -hmm. uh, every single bit of it, the church has simply swallowed Poly wholesale. Poly polygamy, etc. Polygamy, yeah. polygamy too, absolutely. Yeah. So um, the, it became clear, to, I suppose it became clear around about 2013, that the Church of England was not going to be able to turn back. I mean, of course, the Lord will always allow people to repent, cause each of us to repent, cause institutions to repent. Um, but you've got to use common sense as well as hope. Mm -hmm. And in common sense terms, there's no way the church mm -hmm. was ever going to turn back because it's being run by people whose positions in the church were predicated upon their accepting this agenda. Mm -hmm. So they're not going to give it up and say we were wrong and get born again and repent and, and, and uh, mm -hmm. equate themselves with, with the real authenticities of Christian tradition. Yeah. So then, then some American Anglicans said, can I just chip in there? So yeah. the, the words of Rico Tice just come to me, um, uh, who had described Welby's um, invitation for him to be on his evangelistic task force yeah. team in whatever year that was as being impossible because in his view, in Rice's view, um, Welby represented a different religion. Yes, I would say that's exactly true. Well, Welby is deeply, I'm sorry, you know, God, God have mercy on me a sinner, but Welby is deeply sub-Christian, if Christian at all. I mean, he just is. That's that's mm -hmm. he use. However, he uses Christian language, mm -hmm. and 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 you know that's where so many evangelicals get get piously confused, because we're we're we have been trained sociologically to respond to the good words in our tradition, uh, and if people use the good words about you know conversion, Jesus, kingdom, Bible, yeah. renewal, we all go hooray. We sit up and say this is you know, Team Jesus, wonderful. Yeah. <laughs> um, but but. Uh, but if behind the words there is an entirely different agenda, a different, a, a different direction, different priorities, conflicting priorities, then at some point you have to say this person is only using the language and not only has not got it, but has actually got the other thing, which, which is much, even worse. So I'm with Rico Tice at this point. Exactly so. So the American bishops came to me and said, Gavin, we'd like to make you a bishop and begin a mission to England with three Orthodox Anglican bishops in the and, and rebuild Anglicanism. And I said to them, no way. People will think I'm, I'm a megalomaniac if I, if I accept an Episcopal role from your, your quaint and eccentric hands. They'll think, A, I've got really bad judgment and B, all I want to do is wear purple and ponce around. I, I'll lose my reputation, whatever I have. Totally, of course, I'm not going to do that. Mm -hmm. So they then said, is your reputation more important than the kingdom? To which I had to say, well, it can't be. And then they said, in that case, join us. So knowing people would laugh at me <laughs> and say rude things about me, 
uh, I did, and they consecrated me, and we started this plan to gather together independent biblical Anglicans uh, to see, particularly to act as a refuge for other people for whom the Church of England had become a place it could no longer in conscience be. We had no idea how we were going to do it. We just knew that if we stepped out in faith and God wanted it done, it would get done. Mm -hmm. uh, after a couple of years of that, what I discovered was um, something that the Catholic Church knew a lot about, but I knew essentially nothing about, and that was that we lacked a magisterium. Now, what the magisterium is, is it's, it's, a, it's a combined commitment to what the Holy Spirit has taught us over the years. And, and the Catholic Church and the Orthodox Church both have it in the sense that they say, this is the route we've come. This is how the acorn grew into the oak. This is what God has done. These are the, these are the, the, the absolute essential non-negotiables. Mm -hmm. And everyone signs up to them by belonging to the organization. Apostles' the Creed, Nicene Creed, etc. Yeah, absolutely. That's yeah. right. You know, uh, you know the, the, the whole scaffolding of the church, the, the bishops, priests, and deacons, subdeacons, exorcists, whatever, the whole lot. And... Uh, and of course, within the scaffolding, the church has gone wrong. I mean, perhaps one could talk about a, a house. I've often found that quite helpful. So the architecture of the house has to be solid, but but you have furnishings in the house, and you know you can have a you can have a house that's overrun with vermin, where the architecture is solid, and at times that's been the Catholic Church. It's been profoundly corrupt, and it's needed cleansing and fumigating and. You know, the rodents have needed putting down. But but the important thing was that the structure stayed. Or you can have people putting up tents in which there's some glorious spiritual furniture. And you go in there and then the you know, place smells and sings of the kingdom. It's absolutely lovely. But along comes a gale and it blows a tent down because you, you needed a stronger building. Yeah, yeah. So what we have to have is we have to combine the, the kind of the building that God has given us that will withstand the tempests yeah. and, and, and a clean and wholesome inside where the furniture is kingdom furniture. Mm -hmm. And the problem we have is that the model of church we've been we've inherited since the Reformation mm -hmm. means that you only ever get one of those. Mm -hmm. So essentially, you either get structure or you get furnishings or you get, let, let's say, apps. I mean, if I say sort of Catholic, evangelical and charismatic, let's say structure, furnishings and atmosphere. <laughs> and, and, and maybe you get two of those. So you might get furnishings and atmosphere. You, mm -hmm. you sometimes get structure and atmosphere. But, yeah. but, but actually, we have to have all three. Mm -hmm. the, the church has to be, mm -hmm. it has to be, um, well, let's not say Catholic, let's say apostolic, because that's what I really mean. Mm -hmm. It has to be apostolic, it's got to be evangelical, and it's got to be charismatic. Well, and, I, and I, Yeah, I, I, agree with all, I, I agree with all of that. It's, and it's the, kind of, it's the kind of language that excites me and so on, particularly with Reformation in the mix of that. Um... And the problem with the Reformation is, the, what, the reason I didn't mean the, the, I didn't mean the Reformation. I meant just re no, 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 no. Re reform, <laughs> okay. reforming generally. Yeah. So can I just bounce into a kind of small footnote, which we don't yeah, need to pursue at the moment? But one of the things I've tried to persuade my evangelical fellow travelers all the way along is is that the crisis that hit the church in 1520 got sorted. It didn't get sorted very well. There were some good things and some bad things, but it's not the crisis that God's asked us to deal with today. Uh, and and the, the problem that you know, the, the thing, the elephant in the room that's going to separate you and me, well, maybe we can get over it, maybe we can't, is, is the fact that um, reformed evangelical Protestant Christians can't turn their gaze away from the 16th century. And, and actually, 500 years later, we have a different task to please Jesus. And it's not that one. Yeah, I think... As I said this just a couple of podcasts ago, someone had said it seemed to me very seriously that I was a reformed uh, Protestant Christian because I have a beard. And I, I just <laughs> I, I, I just I would have laughed if he'd been joking, but he was deadly serious. And I just, yeah. I just like I just like beards, you know, so I'm not yeah, me too. <laughs> a, a, our potential elephant or impasse is nothing to do with us being. I think you may or may not know we are committed to a non-denominational. Um, we, we think denomination is a huge part of um the problem the chaos yeah yeah um I, I understand that and i'd like to argue it out with you yeah yeah absolutely yeah yeah, yeah. so the the analogy there of the house i like it um and i want to allude if it's okay to one of your articles at the time that you'd moved beyond what you've just described which was the conviction that the anglican uh, church was apostate and enough was enough there is a storm coming and the fact that you've been thinking a, a, about a storm not that's that's not a given is it 
that people are even aware of the storm. It's, mm. it's the, 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 the very nature of the storm is that people are oblivious to the storm, yeah. actually. Um, but then 2019 came where you uh, moved to, to the Catholic Church. And I want to just refer, if it's OK, to, to an article mm. that you'd written in 2019 uh, for the Catholic Herald, where you mentioned the magisterium as the last of three kind of main things, uh, reasons that you were uh, that you'd converted to Catholicism and that that was a compelling reality for you. So magisterium was was the was the third of those three. And then the first. Can we talk about those first two mm. w- without me needing to flick screens to quote it? Because I can mm. just from, uh, from memory um, were, were miracles of the Eucharist. Mm as number two and the first one was marian apparitions mm, yeah so with your analogy in mind that you've just mentioned to do with the structure and what's going on in the structure so of course the other if you extend the metaphor further before we, the metaphor starts to fail is that there's a foundation yeah under any structure whether it's the earth or or a man-made structure there is a foundation and without that jesus words come to mind of, of sinking sand and so on so I think where I've struggled and where, in all honesty, Gavin, my heart sank. Um, (laughs) Yes, no, I'm with you. I understand. And I say say that in all sincerity because... I'm totally supportive of your heart sinking. I know why it sank and I understand why. And I'm really sorry. And and just to make that point, that my my heart probably sank more than most because I firmly believe that father figures... Father, you know the whole thing of the of the of the hearts of the fathers or the parents turning to the children to the sons. Um, I, I just, when when I heard of your conviction in 2017 about the, I said, brilliant. Why? Where? Where are all the men, the fathers? You know, yeah. the, the 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 kind of seasoned Galilean fishermen who have passed through the decades of spiritual sojourn and can come to a point where they're saying this, the things that you're saying and you're indeed saying today. Where are all the fathers? Where are the men who are able to refute and stand against the work of wickedness uh, that is endemic within the likes of, of the Church of England, Church of Scotland, whatever? And then, and then this 2019 conversion, to, and that's where my heart sank. Now, my heart sank because I don't know where to even begin. And, you may, <laughs> and maybe you can help me. I don't even yeah. know where to begin to reconcile your main stated um, burden, the glory of God and the integrity of the word of god i don't i don't know how to resolve new testament with marian apparitions no quite no quite right and 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 one of the reasons why you why you can't possibly expect to resolve it is because the faith you've inherited um so this is not this is not insulting this god god help me not sound insulting. go for it i am i'm okay Uh, so the the problem with the reformed evangelical christian position is that it's it's like a family member who got who's got alzheimer's because, because the family member remembers nothing, essentially, from Pentecost or AD 50 uh, and, until, until 1,500 years later. It's all, it's all blank. And if you would say to the average evangelical Christian, so, what did Je- so when Jesus promised the apostles he w- the Holy Spirit would lead him into all truth, what happened between that moment and you now? Where, where, where is this all truth? And I think without, without meaning to, to kind of win an argument or, or twist the facts, I think most people would say, well, you know, okay, there was Pentecost, that's great. There was Paul, you know, that was, so there we are, two, two, the Holy Spirit, the Gentiles coming into the church, gifts of the Spirit, and boom, and, and the Bible, here I, that's it, and there's, there's nothing in between. So that, but that can't be it. Um, and in fact, historically, we know, you know, that wasn't it. If we look at what happened to the church of, I mean, if we were to take each 500 year segment, for example, that's one way of doing it. Um, so a number of things happened. I started reading uh, Polycarp, who learned his Christianity from John, who got it from Jesus. I mean, po- Polycarp died when he was 160. So in 159, if you'd gone to Bishop Polycarp, as he was, and said, what did Jesus mean when he said, I'm the bread of life? Polycarp would have said, well, when I was sitting next to John at supper, John said Jesus meant this. And, you know, in 159, you would have got that as part of a member of the church. So or- oral tradition. Yes, but I mean the best, but not Chinese whispers, which is what people usually mean by that. No, no, no. I'm, I'm just meaning that oral tradition was what Paul um, endorses yeah. in 1 Corinthians 11. Yeah. So, so I mean, I, or, so, you know, in, in, in my life, oral tradition usually meant German 19th century theologians saying, by the time the story has been told 25 times, you don't, you can't believe it anymore. But mm. it, in a sense, you mean it absolutely. Yeah. 
Um, so, and if you if you read if you read Polycarp, if you read Aranius of Lyon, if you read bit the Pope Clement, if you read Ignatius of Antioch, you, you then discover what God was doing between AD 50 and AD 180, and Justin Martyr. And, and the first thing is that, that it begins to look like the Catholic Church. The language and the concepts begin to look, so that, that freaks out the evangelical, because you think, wait a moment, I didn't expect that. Where, is that. Is that where it came from? But let me tell you, but, 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 so the acorn has to grow into an oak. The Holy Spirit is, did, did 1,500 years of work before Luther. That's a book in itself. But let me tell you how I moved from being a good faithful follower of Jesus yeah. to getting to the Mary stuff. Because because it, it as so often happened, it didn't happen just by thinking. It, it happened by fighting the good fight. So uh, in 2015, I got attacked by the devil. And, and the, the, the stories are really quite profound. Um, but the, the, most, the most dramatic one was I got sent to hell between 1 a.m. and 5 a.m. for three nights running. I can't explain it any other way. The, 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 and I don't even know what happened, but the, my, a wall in my bedroom opened up and became a, like, a, like a black sewer. And out of this black sewer came black something which burnt me. It, my experience was it burnt my flesh and it burnt my soul. And it came at me with despair, accusation, and it was, it was hellish. And I thought I was going mad, because how does that happen? So, so the, it kept me awake for the first night. I prayed. I, I, it, it overcame me. My prayers didn't work. And, and the first, at breakfast the next morning, I phoned up the most powerful Christian I knew, <laughs> you know, my, my father figure who happened. And the reason he was my father figure was because he was a, a Catholic exorcist. And he had brought me on a journey over the last previous 15 years to bring me back from a Jungian understanding of evil to an apostolic one. So we'd been in conferences together where people, where possessed people were delivered. And, and I had started, I, I'd begun as a skeptic, even though I shouldn't have forgotten the devil from my earliest Christian days, I had forgotten. And I remember when a, when a man fell in front of him and began to writhe on the floor, I said, Johnny's having an epileptic fit. No, no, lad, said this man, he was, he, he was from Leeds. He was a Yorkshireman, Darcy was an exorcist from Leeds, and he really kicked us in all kinds of ways. And I'm sorry about my accent. But anyway, no, lad, he said, that's a spirit. What's more, he said, I know which one it is. I've got the name, lad, he said, stand back. <laughs> and I said, John, he's having a fit. Let's find the first aid person to make sure he lies on whichever is the right side to avoid choking. And, and John looked at me with contempt. <laughs> and, and at the end of this all, this, this thing left the man, and, um, and he minced away. And I went, oh, my word, it was a spirit. I, I, I'm going to have to recalibrate mm -hmm. my my uh, what had become a Jungian sense of the inter the interdependence of good and evil, which is a dreadful nonsense, mm -hmm. the shadow stuff that mm -hmm. people have all swallowed from mm -hmm. from Jung. So on, on on that, Gavin, with with the with with the supernatural in mind, can I can I take us to your point about the Marian apparitions? Because yeah. you were I don't want to quote you exactly, but you basically you you were convinced that these were legitimate from uh, what what's the place in Spain called again? Where this happened in the sixties? Uh, Garabondal, yeah, right. Um, Which I used to think was a tea biscuit. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> well. <laughs> What could you say to that? <laughs> <laughs> just, just, just that, that, that that's about the level of my... But can I tell you why I got to Garamond I'm nearly there. It's just, just 90 seconds of, of, of bridge. Yeah, no, of course, of course, of course. So, so um, I phoned John up on the, after, after this all fight, and I said, John, am I losing my mind, or was that the devil? He said, no, you're not losing your mind, particularly because it began at one and ended at five, and you, you don't have a kind of... You don't have remission from nervous breakdowns like that. Uh, so he said, no, you're being attacked. What do I do? Well, you, you pray the rosary. No, I'm not going to pray the rosary. I don't like this Mary stuff. Well, he said, he said, enjoy the devil, he said, in his Yorkshire. <laughs> you got a choice, mate. He said, that's it. You know, I can only tell you what I know. So the next night, I went to bed. One night sleep lost. And it happened again, same time, about five to one. Woke up, this terrifying thing. So I began to, I had, took a rosary to bed just in case. And I began to pray it, but, you know, I was really pissed off, I have to tell you. First of all, I was, I was pissed off because I was having to work out this rosary nonsense. And secondly, uh, I was experiencing hell and it was absolutely, absolutely terrifying. So it lasted another four hours, another night without sleep. Terrible. I, I'm really coming to pieces by this stage. Third night, same thing happens. 
by, by, by about 4 a.m. Uh, with, with three nights without sleep, my wife was also very pissed off and getting worried for me. So you've been working too hard. Why don't you slow down? Why don't you take my advice? It's, you know, you're having, you're going mad. <laughs> it's your fault. <laughs> All those helpful things that domestic tension can sometimes produce. Um, so she dug me in the ribs at four o'clock on the third night and said, you know, you're, you're having such trouble. I'm surprised you're looking for more. And I said, oh, sweetheart, leave me alone. I'm really, I'm really, I really am in trouble. I said, so, so, well, why, why, are you, you know, why are you looking for a domestic fight? I said, I'm not. I've just fallen asleep for the first time in three nights. I, you know, I'm going mad. Leave me alone. She said, well, you've left the window open. Now, for, for our listeners who don't know why this is a domestic crime in the Ashenden household, my wife suffers from a particular sensitivity of the nose. She, she, she could become a marvellous wine taster. Mm -hmm. And so in the spring, we close the windows because she can't sleep because it gags her. Mm -hmm. uh, and uh, I said, I, I closed the windows before I got to bed. No, she said, now you're lying. Don't, don't add lying to irresponsibility. You're in enough trouble. I said, I, I, you know, I'm not lying. She said, oh, you know, really, I thought better of you. And she got up and went to the windows and she came back. And I said, right, what did you find? She said, the window's closed. Okay, so she said, well, you need to explain to me why the room is full of the smell of roses, so full of the smell of roses, I can't sleep. And I said, well, you know, my reading of the 12th and 13th century mystical theology is that means Mary's around. Well, she said, it's about time. You've been clacking those beads for three nights. It's about time she showed up. <laughs> I don't know how serious she was, but then my wife became Catholic before I did. But but the devil went away. This thing stopped. We were in a house where some occultists had been tenants before. Whenever I went away, icons got thrown off the wall. My wife used to say, please don't go and speak at this conference because I don't want to be woken up by icons flying off the wall as they do at night. This is, you know, mm -hmm. and 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 I used all my charismatic authority to try and cleanse the place, but I couldn't stop this. And it stopped when we had a rosary prayer group in the house. Now, this is all this. I'm not I'm not proving anything. I'm just saying this is this is the map by which I began to take it seriously. So then I thought I better well, work. Sorry, out. Gavin, I'm sorry. I just want to clarify because it's helpful to have when you say all of your charismatic authority. Can you just and what do you mean? Well, uh, I had so for the first 15 years of my life, I had been a full-blown charismatic in which I found myself, including as a vicar, dealing with evil in one form or another. And I would essentially rebu you rebuke Satan uh, and look for cleansing of people, places, things, events, memories. There was a, there was a marvelous period where many of us got hold of a book called Healing the Family Tree mm. um, by a guy called McCall, I think. And um, also one of the greatest authorities was a guy called Francis McNutt, who was a Catholic theologian and priest uh, on healing. So in the 1970s, 1980s, uh, and the Healing the Family Tree was an, e was an evangelical missionary in China who started practicing a requiem mass for the dead in order to save people from being harassed by familial spirits. So you know, he went out as a good Protestant evangelical and, and, and wrote a book saying only, only by discovering the requiem mass have I learned the deliverance ministry, which these people need? So this didn't do anything, it is, but, but people went, oh, well, that's interesting. Um, but, but again, I'm sorry. I just want to be very clear on that thing of that charismatic, because I, don't, I just want to make sure I've understood you. My understanding of charismatic authority, if there was some kind of demonic uh, presence or whatever, would be simply to use the name Jesus. Yes, absolutely. Is that yeah. what you mean? Is that what you mean? Uh, that's, where you, that's what I start with. Yes, absolutely. And, that's and, the first and, and you're saying that in those moments, nothing happened? Yes. Yes. So there was demonic activity and the name of Jesus. Didn't get it. Yeah, there, you see, I wish people could see your face there. No, that well, was, I, no. That I'm was not, my face too, absolutely. Well, no, that's, that's not, that's not um, my face there, just for people listening. It's not, <laughs> it's not a, a face of acceptance or surprise. No, it's, it's, it's a face it's, of revulsion and, and astonishment and what's going on here. Anyway, carry on. So, I mean, you know, but basically your face summed up what I, what I felt. It's exactly the case. And, and I, so, you know, one can say, well, I'm, you know, is there anything I haven't repented of? Am I not holy enough? You know, am I not doing the Lord's will? There are all the kind of checklist things that any, that any Christian would then ask himself if he's failing to cut it in the face of, of spiritual battle. Uh, you know, m the next one is I can't do this by myself. I need two or three or whatever, or I need a whole church or I, or I need someone with particular gifts. But anyway, whatever it was, um, it was the rosary that began 
to do the fight back at this point, also for the flying icons. So anyway, I thought I better go and find out about this stuff. I was in my academic office uh, looking at the uh, the, the um, video. Well, the reason Garibaldi Garibald came up was I didn't want any oral tradition. Uh, Garibaldi happened in 1963 during my lifetime. Fatima, I found inaccessible. Portugal, 19, uh, 1917, too far away. But when I was not, something happening when I was nine, I thought, let's go for that one, because I know what the world ought to look like when I was nine. And, and I bet it's been filmed, and it had, it had been filmed. So I thought, let's start with video, video stuff of when I was nine, and let's see what all this stuff is about. Uh, and I was looking at the video stuff, and into my academic office came a colleague of mine who was a research psychologist. And she said, what the heck is that? Uh, she was a Christian. And I said, well, I said, I don't know. That's what I'm trying to work out. It purports to be three children being taught by Mary in the presence of the Archangel Gabriel to pray the rosary. But I said, you know, like you say, what is it? Mm. So she took a look and she said, well, whatever those children tell you is happening to them, I would believe it. And I said, well, what, why do you say that? So, well, because we've been doing a number of studies with children of that age, pre-recent children, and one of the, the whole thing, a number of things they can't fake. They can't fake ecstasy. Um, and, and those children unless, are- Unless they're possessed. Oh, absolutely. Of course. Yeah, and that goes without saying. Uh, absolutely. Well, it, doesn't, of... it doesn't go without saying, because that's not what's, if you read your article, I'm reading your article thinking, where you talk about being compelled by these Marian apparitions, which, yeah, yeah. to be clear for everybody listening, is what you just said is is a supernatural vision of Mary? Um, no, it might be, might be, might be. I was I was trying to find out if it was or not. And, and you're quite right. I, you know, I take your point. You're right. I'm wrong. It doesn't go without saying. It absolutely has to be said. It could be a satanic. It it, it probably is. Let's go much further than that. It probably is a satanic counterfeit. Um, and, you know, one of the things in the monastic tradition is if a monk gets woken up by a vision of Jesus or an angel, or Mary, and goes to the abbot in the morning saying, I've had this, the abbot will always say, go back to bed, you were being deceived. Always, always. Until and unless some extra element comes which proves it wasn't deception. We must assume 99% of the time, well, actually, nine times out of 10, that we're being deceived. I couldn't agree more. It, it, it should, I, I shouldn't have said it, that goes without saying it, does but, but But I'm, again, just going on a, a one article in my head where you felt that your psychologist friend who had said that children experiencing ecstasy can't be fake. I'm yes. thinking, well, it can if it's demonic. Yeah. Um, so, so why was it then with you accepting that, that you found that a compelling reason to convert to Catholicism? Where you, <laughs> no, 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 stop, stop, stop. No, you're, 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 you're doing to me what, what, what you know, uh, nice, nice debating technique. I'm sure you didn't mean it, but, but no. I, the, so if you're writing a, a 1,200-word article, you have to, su to summarise. Uh -huh. If you're telling a story, you have to summarise. I'm, uh, I'm not that good at debating, Gavin. <laughs> <laughs> no, but it's a good, it's a good point. But, but what I'm trying to say is that um, I saw this thing. I was impressed by the fact that she was impressed, and I thought I'd take it to the next stage. So the next stage of looking, okay, maybe this, uh, I mean, someone to put some dreadful spooky music to, which really put me off very badly. Um, so I, I, I looked at the next stage of it, and then I began to listen to the children as they'd grown up, and, uh, and, and the question is, what was Mary saying to the church? And Mary, what Mary was saying to the church was unexceptional and made it unlikely they were possessed. Not, not impossible, but unlikely, because she was saying, tell the grown-ups they've got to repent and pray harder and believe in my son. Well, well, it... No, just look, it's not, it's not a knockdown argument. It's, it's, just, it's just one strand in, in, the, in the pursuit. So then, so then I thought, okay, so let me go and look at the other ones to see what's happened. Um, there are problems with Garabondal, and actually the Catholic Church has never authenticated it. Uh, it's it, it has remained completely agnostic about whether this was authentic. Um, there was a very interesting moment, which I quite liked, where the bishop, who, said, who took the view that you quite rightly start with, that children are deluded, this is satanic, the bishop forbade them to go into church. They used to, they used to go into church and pray around the Blessed Sacrament. And so they then complained to, to the supposed uh, vision of Mary, and they said, Mary said, why aren't you going to the church? And they said, well, the bishop's forbidden us. And, and Mary said, you must obey the bishop. And I thought, well, that's interesting. 
because that's inconvenient for a for a satanic cultish event. Um, and you and 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 the moment you the moment you get humility and obedience in anything, you can begin to say that's a good sign on on the kind of plus or minus list. Humility and obedience count count for a great deal because you ne you never see them with satanic counterfeit. You, I mean, they just don't appear. Uh, they, they are the things the devil really hates almost more than anything else. Um, so I went, but I went from this one thinking, well, who knows? Uh, and I began to look at the rest of them. Uh, the, one of the ones that's always impressed me most was was one that took place in about 320 with a man called Gregory Thalmaturges. He was a he was a Syrian bishop. He was involved in some controversy over the creed. He was he became a very powerful evangelist in Asia Minor, and he had a moment of crisis. And in that moment of crisis, he says, uh, or Eusebius says, he says, that Mary and John came to him and said, why are, why are you on your backside? Get off your backside. The Lord is with you. Here's the answer to your theological problems of the creed. Now go and kick some ass and evangelize you're supposed to. Mm -hmm. so having had Mary and John come to him say that, he did, and the rest, is, as they say, is history. So wh whether, whether John or Mary or, uh, again, I appreciate that this is being a little bit, sharp in the sense of i'm just trying to keep no, be it sharp in. sharp is, it, it, is is how do you reconcile this with the new testament i'd still not clear on that even oh yeah that's the, absolutely so the, the the mount of to me the mount of transfiguration is the way i theologically reconcile it and the book of revelation and and on the mount of trans so the theological premises which seem to me to to make this at least possible let's not say let, let, let's keep all your quite proper reservations you you and all the abbots of all time so hang on wait a minute don't, don't swallow this too easily. But the theological and biblical mechanism for at least allowing this as a possibility, um, which on the whole you don't, I don't see evangelicals dealing with theologically, is mm -hmm. the Mount of Transfiguration, mm -hmm. where Moses and Elijah are there, they're talking to Jesus, the disciples are surprised, mm -hmm. they're quite clearly involved in the kingdom project, mm -hmm. uh, and um, you know, they, 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 they break through time and space in, in, in the context of let's say fellowship, best word to use, I think. Uh, and if you look at the book of Revelation, you look at, um, at all the people, we won't call them saints, just to keep the thing theologically clean. You look at all the people who've died and are with Jesus, and they, they look at the struggle that's going on on earth, and, and they act like a, like a crowd of, of cheerleaders or people who are very deeply involved with the struggle. And it was once described, I think quite usefully to me, as a bit like a stadium. So those of us who are alive, we're on the pitch, we're playing the match against the evil ones, and all the people who died are in the stands, and, and any footballer knows or rugby player knows that if you have people shouting in the stands, it really lifts you and gets and keeps you going. And you're gonna play in an empty stand. And, and not not to know, not to understand the communion of saints is like unnecessarily playing the match in an empty stand. Why would you do it if you could have the whole crowd with you? Mm -hmm. So, wow. so, and if you, now, again, the amnesia thing, the, the rather slightly rude thing I said earlier on about, about reformed Christianity suffering from Alzheimer's amnesia is that if you look at what happened in the, in the 1500 years, um, there are some very weird and, 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 and grotesque things claimed, but there's a whole lot of miraculous and wonderful stuff too. Uh, William James, who but we're, but we're not we're not like this is again. I got to I've got to interrupt because I will yeah, be here all, all day. It, yeah, I, I I take your point in terms of the, the the you know the gap between Jesus on the earth and you know the the periods that you outlined at the beginning of the podcast basically, but we're not our authority for living. And I, I this is this is one of the big differences, isn't it, between Catholicism and protestantism is the magisterium now this authority that the church have the catholic church have in terms of interpreting the word of god the bible We're, because a period isn't as known to us i think this is what you're saying that we we've got this kind of amnesia or whatever of a period of history during which there were x y and z things that happened and yet the basic and a child, and I'm, I am trying to be childlike and basic here. Basic yeah, childlike yeah. understanding of the New Testament is that the word, you know, basically not going beyond what's written. And I, I understand that there are weird, you know, windows into the into the realm of mystery. You know, for example, like Samuel mm. in the Old Testament, yeah. and this weird thing with the witch of whoever and raising whoever mm. uh, Samuel. Sorry, Saul and Samuel, wasn't it? Um, but in terms of the overall New Testament. I don't see Paul teaching or, or Jesus teaching about 
the kind of stuff you're now saying is compelling uh, in terms of apparitions of Mary, in terms of miracles of the Eucharist, or, or indeed this this understanding of the magisterium from a Catholic <laughs> church. But I don't see that. Well, you know, let me let me te- let me tease you enough and, t- and tell you that you know what I love most of all is 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 Paul and his teaching on relics. <laughs> okay. Well, because it's all um, so. First of all, on a more serious note, I agree with you. It's got to be scriptural. Scripture is our paradigm. We cannot have anything that contradicts scripture. On the other hand, scripture is is not prescriptive in the sense. Well, it is prescriptive, of course, it is. Um, but what we have in scripture is, is is event and principle, and and sometimes interpretation too. I mean, particularly with Paul, thank goodness. Um, but so you know, one of the things uh, people got very cross with the medieval church about relics, but but you suddenly discover that Paul's handkerchief is used to deal with demonic infestation, and, and if that's not a relic. I don't know what is. Um, that, that's exactly what the church thought it was doing in the 12th and 13th century. Now, you know, but it was I know one, in, one incident, though, wasn't it? Yeah, no, of course it was one incident. But 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 hang on, don't do, don't don't demean your argument with special pleading. It was one incident, and 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 from it comes some theological principles we need to look at. So the first thing we need to say is, well, uh, does this contradict anything else in in the New Testament? Because we do have to deal sometimes with the fact that we have contradictory things in scripture that get need that are problematic to get worked out. Mm-hmm. So, you know, is there anything contradictory? Well, well, not, not really. Um, Purgatory is in scripture in, in 1 Corinthians 3, where Paul talks about the fact that on the last day, we're all, a judgment is going to come upon us and burn everything up. There isn't pure gold. Um, and although he then doesn't go on into a, a an outworked the, theology of purgatory, it certainly sets it, it is the scriptural passage that sets the normative theological understanding of what we're talking about at that point. Um, so, but, but, but there is a difference, Gavin, between that bit in 1 Corinthians 3, giving an understanding of, of the Catholic understanding and teaching about purgatory and simply the end of the age, the end of the eschaton and the contents of Revelation. There's a, there are, there's a massive difference there. Well, there might be. So, of course, you're, every single one of these, every single one of these passages. Uh, let me start the thing again. In the history of the church, what we have is is the church. We have we have the apostolic church with five with five pentateuch pentateuchs: uh, Rome, Antioch, Alexandria, Jerusalem, and then Constantinople. Five centers of apostolic authority, and and the church is united. For a thousand years, and then there's this spat in 1054, and the East and the West divide. Um, one of the interesting things that evangelicals don't do is they don't. They always complain about Catholics. They never complain about the Orthodox. But the ortho, but Orthodoxy is is at one with almost everything. It has a slightly different version of Dormition instead of uh, Mary's um, uh, Assumption. It has a slightly different view on on purgatory, but but not hugely. But n- nobody ever complains about orthodoxy, and I th- and I think well, I'm I'm not I'm not complaining about orthodoxy because orthodox these guys you're talking about aren't saying the stuff that you've been saying in 2017. Yeah, but I think they are. No, I don't, no, they really are. But I I would say that my Christianity is the Christianity of the of, of the Bible, the apostles, and the first thousand years. And 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 the problem with evangelical and Protestant Christianity is that it filters all that through the lens of 16th century culture, rationalism and empiricism. And that's a problem I've got with the reformed tradition. It, 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 was a, it was a holy renewal movement that should have cleaned up the church from a great deal of, of, of you know, crap yeah. that the church got itself into. That was its job. Every single century, the Holy Spirit sent reformers into the church every single time. They never stopped. And they still aren't stopping. But the problem with the Reformation is it took the reform and it went away and played with it by itself. It, it, its job was to clean the church up. And it decided, no, we're not going to do that. We're going to start our new church. Yeah. A new church. A new church. Indeed. A thousand new churches. Indeed. And, you know, yeah. and, and it, the, the reformers need to do what I've done, heal the church, come back and bring all the gifts that God has given them back into the church mm-hmm. so that the church can be one and unified again. That, that's the task for today. Mm-hmm. The Reformation was a, was a cul-de-sac. Yeah. Well, I was going to say this earlier, the, the, the Reformation didn't go far enough. That was, the, <laughs> I think, I think, well, it didn't, you know, because the result yeah, of it, it was what we've got today. Yeah. Um, this, this insipid willingness to, to kind of agree to disagree about stuff that just, you know, rationally, um, we should have more, we should have more conviction is what I'm trying to say. No, um, look, I, I completely understand your position and you may be right. I absolutely. 
but there's an alternative view, and that, which is the one I'm trying out. Mm -hmm. uh, and and you know, what we should do is we should play both these things out to see what would happen under both scenarios. Um, I, I happen to think that, as you quite rightly say, the Reformation, we both agree the Reformation didn't go far enough. It got its charism wrong somehow. Um, I, I look back at, the, at what the Holy Spirit was doing for 1,500 years before in all the small Reformations, and we see the same patterns. God raises up holy people to challenge power, bad theology, the, the setting aside of scripture, to clean his church up. And whether, whether it's St. It's Francis uh, or, or Martin Luther, um, or, or Gregory the Great, it's always the same pattern. But you don't break the church and start a new one. Because if you do, you then, you know, the cat catastrophe arises. Mm -hmm. And and the fact that the the fact that out of the broken church, that Luther, I mean, you know, you know, as well as I do, Luther didn't want it broken, but they accepted it. I mean, you know, we you know, we have a lot of like feminism, we have first and second, third wave Luther. Um, but the third wave Luther says, okay, well, let's go for it. Let's just, let's just do it. Um, but 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 first wave and second wave Luther would have been very upset by that idea, and the outcome has been at least a thousand different churches who can't agree about the authority of Scripture. So that's got to be wrong, you know. And if that's wrong, you know, so 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 you know, my case is that's wrong. So what's right? What does God want for His reformed and renewed church? And I look back at um, I don't much like Catholic culture in the sense that that, that all culture is man-made and, and, and corrupted. And there's all kinds of things about orthodoxy. I really can't get my head round. But I am convinced that, that what happened in 1054 was absolutely tragic and needs fixing. What happened in 1519 was absolutely tragic and needs fi fixing. Just, be, now, just, for, just for folk listening, could you just bullet points what, what those two dates represent? So 1054 was when was the point at which uh, the Patriarch of Constantinople and the Patriarch of Rome had a hissy fit. Uh -huh. and, and they they, they they had representatives who got their knickers in a twist, misunderstood things. But they but most importantly, actually, they got caught up in contemporary politics. There were a whole load of political and philosophical reasons why they were set against each other and couldn't understand each other. But instead of taking the time and following scriptural precepts in all humility to forgive each other and, 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 not, and not to expel one another, they had a hissy fit and they broke the church. Effectively, they, they broke communion, excommunicated each other. But you would still say that Welby was sub-Christian? Oh, yes, absolutely. Yes, I'm, I, I, I would not. I would not and could not. So the, the, the healing of, of the schism in 1054 is not the model that I would want with Justin Welby. I would not accept any fellowship with Welby until he repented. So in other, exactly. So in other words, repentance and, and division, uh, well, division is necessary, 1 Corinthians 11, 19. Uh, so I, I, I wish I had a quick reply because you're, you've raised something enormously problematic. Um, mm -hmm. You cannot be yoked with an unbeliever there are times when division has to take place but equally before you divide the body of christ you really 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 have to think very carefully pope, pope clement after paul failed to, to, to stop the corinthians trying to go off in all their sectarian difficulties in ad 60 they, they were at it again in ad 90 and 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 peter's successor wrote to them essentially in paul's name and said look guys stop it this is not, not how you behave. The schismatic tendencies in the church are absolutely constant. They've been there from the very beginning. Mm -hmm. um, they, they say in AD 90, the Corinthian church sacked all their apostolic leaders yeah. and, and, and had new ones. And, and so Peter's, Peter's successor said, you, you're not to do church like that. You cannot sack the apostolic leaders. And yeah, but, and, yeah, and I'm holding your toes over the fire here a bit, Gavin, yeah, because, go ahead. Because, because your, your stance is the same as mine with regard to Welby or with regard, yeah. with regard to my, uh, Michael Curry or whoever is that schism and division whatever it's in it's for a purpose isn't it and and i think you i think you're arguing the same thing which is that there is a need for for these kind of divisions but it's it's the purpose of it isn't it it's not if if people's concern is well you sh you should think very carefully before promoting a divisive solution to unfaithfulness in the church or the body of christ it's also important to think well are people who are in wrong standing with god in the church are, are they, in other words are folk like ashen um that's yourself are, are yes. folk like welby or whoever are they actually do they know god it's not it's not our place but there's evidence for asking if they do know god because because when we put what god wants to them they don't recognize it 
that's that's the awful thing i mean if you said to me um look gavin jesus says this he wants this what are you going to do about it i yeah. could not resist you <laughs> i wouldn't be able to resist you but when you say to welby jesus wants this welby comes up with a whole load of excuses saying well i don't think he does anymore jesus's mind in the 21st century is not the same as it was in every single century up to half an hour ago and then you've got to say well wait a moment you've got a jesus of your own imagination because my Jesus, I know through, not just through my imagination, though I do, but my imagination is captive to the New Testament and to the mind of the church that has held the New Testament faithfully ever since and not deviated. You know, the things that the Church of England is doing now, it, it is perverting aspects of the faith that have never deviated over 2,000 exactly, years. Yeah. And, 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 and so, I mean, but part of the problem with, with, with not being Catholic, or the, so part of the problem with the Protestant churches is how do you, if Welby was a Catholic, he could be suspended. <laughs> I mean, the, the, the church would say, you've broken the faith. Convert and, him, convert him, please. Yeah, well, yes, that's right. And they would say, you know, you don't have the authority to run a church by yourself. You are suspended until you, you know, go off and live in a monastery and read the Bible for 10 years and come back when you're better. But, but, the, but the problem with having a whole series of churches outside the apostolic structure is they can do what they like. Mm -hmm. And so you can't hold them accountable. So the, the, the problem that you quite rightly raise is when do you divide the body of Christ only comes in a Protestant structure. It doesn't come within the Catholic structure. Within the Catholic structure, what happens is they, they, they get rebuked and suspended, but well, in theory, when it's working properly at any rate. Yeah. I, uh, you don't know me very well, Gavin, but I could, I could be here for hours talking with you and your time doesn't afford that. Um, and my bladder doesn't yes. afford that either. <laughs> well, but I, I'm, I'm willing to be more flexible with my time than you are with your bladder. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Um, but just, just it's important to be clear. I, I, I don't know. I, I'm struggling. I'm still. I don't feel like I'm. No, Nick. I haven't. I haven't brought you with me. I understand that. But what I'd like, what I'd like to say to you and to people listening is, I share a hundred percent your, 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 the, your, the concerns and the values that you. For the kingdom that you bring where we are we are absolutely at one on them the the difference between us is that as i began as i looked at the acorn and began to trace the roots of the tree i'm convinced that the tree that we have in catholicism and orthodoxy is the apostolic tree and and i understand that you're not and and it won't and there are so many branches we would have a long time discussing them mm -hmm. um but 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 as i've uh, as with the mary stuff um uh, I, I, I love the mother of Jesus very much, and I'm so glad she's on my team. And, and she is the second Eve. She's the Eve who got it right, not the Eve who got it wrong. She's, the Ark, you know, the Ark of the Covenant contained the, the priestly bud, the, the, the word of God, in the, the, ten, the Ten Commandments, and, and manna from the desert. Mm -hmm. And Mary in her womb contains the, 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 the priest, the eternal priest of the Melchizedek, the, the Logos, the word of God, yeah. and the bread of life. And so... She isn't just an ingenue Palestinian girl who happens to have an angelic experience. She's, she's the culmination of everything that God did in the Old Testament, the first mm -hmm. covenant, to get us ready for his beloved and most wonderful son, our Savior, Jesus Christ. Yeah. Mary only matters because, she's, because she is the means by which Jesus chose to make himself present. Yeah. Everything she has derives from him. The, the, the critical thing for me is seeing it. And yeah. I, I'm, you know, I would say this to Vicky Beeching over the, the sexual issue, and I've mentioned this publicly a number of times. Her book didn't show me or anyone anything because it's not there yeah. on the on the issues where you and I have full agreement on the sexual issue or any of the issues that you mentioned earlier, the trans issues, you know, the feminism issues or whatever. It has to be script. Like my life has got to be not not based on hearsay. It has to be there for me to see. And hence my final question before I have an accident is um <laughs> perhaps you perhaps you've written more than, than than the article that i'm looking at here from the catholic herald in 2019 i don't know if you're writing more or whatever because for me to even begin to be convinced i'm not about the rosary beads or mary or whatever that there needs to be exegetical understanding yeah. and if if that doesn't exist it's never going to happen i i would love to get a beer with you and just relax and chill out and talk i would love that and i'm sure loads of people would but in terms of answering our most important questions here in terms of the faithfulness of the church and our understanding of why the reformation didn't go far enough um, was ultimately to do with faithfulness and the division 
is absolutely needed for faithfulness, not not just be, to be right or to be whatever. Um, I've done about 100 and I've done the same thing. I'm coming back. I've done about 150 podcasts and that's never <laughs> that's never happened before. <laughs> well, I, I've, I've made use of the same thing. So, and it's given me a moment to take to my answer. So first of all, let me commend a guy called Stephen K. Ray to you. Uh, Stephen K. Ray is a really clever um, ex-Baptist. Mar- Mar- I mean, he sounds like a Texan Baptist. He, he can never. And he became uh, a formidable, competent evangelical theologian. Uh, he's written the books that, that there's no point in my reading because he's written them um, about biblical exegesis. And, and it's absolutely not my desire to make you become a Catholic, Nick. I wouldn't, I would be so presumptuous. I wouldn't want to, wouldn't dream of it. But, but I, have jo- I have rejoined the Apostolic Church. And I'm really, let's forget the word Catholic because it has so many bad associations. I've rejoined the Apostolic Church, which is one church and, and undivided uh, and has been so since since our Lord said to Peter upon this rock, I'm going to build my church. Um, there are a lot of the problem we have at the moment in the Protestant world is the Protestant world is giving way and it cannot find a common mind amongst itself to manage the crisis that we've got. The Catholic Church is taking a terrible hammering. It's not in very good shape at all. And, and in human terms, it looks like it may not come through, actually, but if any church is going to stand up to what the storm that we're facing is going to be the Catholic Church, because it has the roots, the structure and the magisterium, the, the, the common, the common mind that has survived 2000 years. Um, you're, you're so right to bring up Bonhoeffer. We're very, it, we're, there are many similarities to Germany in the, in the 1930s. And, uh, you know, Bonhoeffer was preparing for an, for an underground church. He realized what the state was going to do and how it was going to turn on him. The, the role of the Pope in the Second World War was absolutely magnificent. Most people don't know about it. The, the problem was every time when he first rebuked Hitler, Hitler destroyed a village with 10,000 people in it and said, every time you speak out against me, I'm going to do that again. So from then on, the, the Pope then set out to subvert uh, the Nazis uh, with a whole with, with a spy network and a bunch of people who got it. Mm-hmm. Um, Benedict got it. Benedict wrote something in about 1979 when he said the church is going to become knocked for six and it's going to become small and, and, and purified. And, you know, the fact that a pope could say that prophetically was extraordinary. So I expect, I'm afraid, I think we will see the, the Protestant sheep very badly scattered, looking for, looking for a, a place to, to gather around where they, they can be safe from the storm. We'll see the Catholic Church absolutely hammered mm-hmm. uh, with a small remnant. But, but, and but it's perhaps, at that, on, sorry, it's go, at that go, point yeah. that, we, that we need to come together. Perhaps the scattering, though, isn't to, to find somewhere new to gather around. Maybe, maybe the Reformation and the, the, the cleansing and, and whatever else is the scattering in the sense of, uh, you know, the, the focus on people's homes not to say isolate an isolate kind of island living where we don't have accountability or, or the joy of fellowship. I just mean this thought that there needs to be a central place or hub or building, or whatever metaphor around which everyone goes to survive the storm rather than, um, well, rather than people kind of not needing that or, you know, the, the magister, you know, do you see what I'm saying? Well, kind of, but I think I'd like to pick, take you back to the New Testament. And I, my, my image is Pauline, Pauline and Petrine apostolic authority. Uh, the, 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 the people of God were, were one. They didn't have the Bible, as you know. They only got the Bible in, in 394 with the first Council of Carthage. And they, you know, they had a God the Gospel. They had a couple of letters. They had, you know, the, the Epistle of Hermas. They had the Didache. They had, a, they had stuff, very useful stuff. But there wasn't the Bible. Mm-hmm. What they had was the oral tradition and apostolic authority and a few bits of Scripture. Mm-hmm. Um, so, so, you know, we have the whole of Scripture. Fantastic. We should be doing better since mm-hmm. we have it. Indeed. But I'm afraid I think we need apostolic authority to hold us together. Mm-hmm. And, and and until the Protestants realize, you know, you know, you're very kindly holding my toes to the fire. So, you know, have one back and yeah. in love, in humility, until the Protestants realize they need apostolic authority, they're not going to find a place to shelter safely. I do. I, you don't need to hold my toes uh, very long over that for, for that issue, because I agree with you about the magist- the principle of the magisterium in the 
our, our creeds or the you know whether the, today it is virtual it, there needs it's almost like we need something new at this moment in history yeah. in order to what's the word consolidate if, if if that's the right word everything that you're you're talking about as being compelling for where the protestant evangelical church today is is just a drift you know bill johnson or the proc trust you know it's like what 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 does the average person in our street our hundred people who who we reached out to on the first of December last year the first thing we apologize was apology we're so yeah, sorry yeah. for the state yeah. of the church we understand yeah. that you wouldn't sacrifice IKEA or you know Frankie and Benny's for church and why would you yeah Frankie and Benny's probably have a better creed policy department than the church. So anyway, our time's gone. Well, no, and, and likewise, the Catholic Church is saying, we're so sorry that in the 20th century, we allowed it a homosexual spirit to pervade the church, which then wreaked havoc on your children. We're really, really, really sorry. And, it, and, and we've just begun to get to terms with it. I mean, the, the level of sorry the church needs to say to itself and to, and to the people is, is a very profound one. But we can say it, and we can also say that when we say sorry, God begins to fix things. Um, but, but, you know, the whole of my life, I, one of the things I'm very, very glad about is to be part of an ecclesial community that is finally one. You know, as an evangelical, there were so many tribes to belong to, so many people of influence, so many centres of power. It, it got quite mind-boggling, and I got really tired going around. So, you know, is, is the Lord most with these people or the other? It, yeah. it is a huge relief to rejoin the apostolic church, to heal the Reformation, and to pray for the spirit of renewal within the one apostolic church, which has the Bible. You know, the great thing about being a Catholic is, is, is everyone in the church agrees that the Bible has authority. Of course, it's mediated through the understanding of the church, but that's always true. You know, whenever any Bible study group reads the Bible, it sets out to interpret it through the mind, with the mind of that group. Of course it does. But nonetheless... The, 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 the Catholic and the Orthodox Church are absolutely clear and always have been that scripture has an authority in a way that, frankly, Protestantism, most of it gave up on. When we when we talked about this is where we can just finish and pray. Um, when we talked about c clarifying Catholicism just the last couple of weeks with Dave Brennan and, and with Mary, we did talk about that. We talked about the, the elements of Catholicism that are attractive. And one of them yeah. is, as you have just mentioned, so there's not, there's no denying that, that the, the not, I'm not defending the, the, yes. I'm not, I'm not defending um, evangelicalism at all. I'm saying that that's as meaningless as, uh, you know, uh, other things. It doesn't mean anything to say you're a Christian today. No, well, so, so if I got into to rhetoric and debate, I'm, I apologise. Not so at in all, a, not in, at all. In, in a calmer way, let me say, effectively, what we should all be doing is saying, Lord Jesus, where do you want me and what do you want from me? That, that, that That's that's the question we're asking. So, frankly, at the age of 60-something or other, Jesus said, OK, it's now time for you to rejoin the Catholic Church. Well, so it took me 60-something years. That's all right. I wouldn't dream my my 25 year old self would have had a great deal of trouble with this conversation. It would have been deeply suspicious of me in my in my 60s. And I would understand that because, you know, because of the and I would simply I would just say to my 25 year old self, look, we're completely committed to Jesus and his word. Right. Yeah. So I would say to my 25 year old, trust me, that's never changed. It will never change when I draw breath. I promise you, mm -hmm. if I'm mistaken, show me, show me, show me where Satan or ego or stupidity have misled me and I will repent. I promise you, I'm mm -hmm. absolutely up for repentance. Um, but but the, the body, the apostolic body of Christ I've rejoined, which has got very many flaws, it's it's the I, I really do sincerely believe it's the it's the church that Jesus founded. Mm -hmm. And I'm glad we're back in the church that Jesus founded. And I think because he founded it. He's going to go on looking after it. And over 2,000 years, it's done everything. It was a Catholic church, along with the Catholic Orthodox Church, that converted the pagans. It was a Catholic Orthodox Church that invented the universities. It, it, invented, it, it provided the template for human rights. It's done everything. Everything good has come from this apostolic church. Mm -hmm. It's also done some terrible things, and God, it's been under judgment, and God has cleaned it up and is cleaning it up. But one of the things we have, I think we have to have a very good reason for separating ourselves from each other at this particular juncture in history. Yeah, well, I think there are a bucket full load of good reasons why I would separate <laughs> myself from a lot of people. And if that is something the Lord needs to show me and many others who I think have come to a place of 
uh, who don't have the, the same kind of rich experiences that, and if uh, if you don't mind me saying privileges that you've had i don't mean that from a social no, no, no. point no, of view exactly. i mean just i just mean your i'm i'm thinking of people that don't know god yeah and you know i am um, i'm sorry i'm i'm it's, it's a it's a classic thing you want to bring everything to a neat conclusion and, and i'm i'm afraid this podcast doesn't do that but I resist, I resist it being a kind of jazz chord because you want to bring it to a resolve uh, and it's not going to do that. But, um, but, but just... we, have, we, have, we have a light motif we do agree on. It's obedience. It's obedience and repentance. Yeah, and wholeheartedness yeah. and willingness yeah. to repent and Absolutely. Ass- assume blind spots, like Psalm 139, 24. And we're on, a, we're on a journey. Paul was on a journey. There were things he had to learn. Peter did too. Even, even after... You know, I mean, even after Paul has all his experiences, um, you know, Paul is still growing in, as you can see, grow in the way he pastors his people. I mean, sometimes he, you know, as in two Corinthians, he really loses it. I love, I, I, I love Paul for when, losing for, it. when he loses. I really love it because I, you know, because because I'm in the same place. If I say we're on a journey, I don't mean it in the self-referential, existential yes. rage yeah, way. Yeah, yeah. What I mean is that 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 we're walking a road with Jesus for all of us we're on different parts of the road the most important thing is that he has our hand and our direction and and i don't want you to become a catholic i'm just very content to leave you in the hands of jesus and he'll do whatever he wants to do with you that's all that matters yeah yeah yeah. well maybe you'd pray for us and maybe we we can talk again or liaise or or um do a vlog or you know yeah, well, what, would, what would be great is if is if i mean if you have listeners who say well wait a moment you know these things need further thought you were careless as i as you've seen i've been careless sometimes um you know can but they but they matter can we please deal with them um uh, i mean one of the things we haven't talked about is sexuality uh, I, I always thought that the catholic church was crazy with with celibacy suddenly in the last 10 years i've seen celibacy as 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 an awareness of the fire of of lust and a, and a way of dealing with it yeah. that nobody else has ever dealt with. And I I would love to talk more about the the you know the demonic stuff the the, mm. the metaphysical evil that you refer to. Um, so so maybe we can liaise and come well, back. You know I, I'm I'm not I'm not trying to set up a second gig, but if it turns if it seems good no to no you, no I would I, I, well I, that's without question absolutely would be needed. But it's, it's uh, yeah. so if it's good to you the Holy Spirit and our listeners that we should talk more. Let's do it. If not, um, we've got lots to think about. And, and yes, let's pray. Be great. Well, we can say to listeners like if you've got anything specific, please do come back and leave questions, and we can weave that into a, into yeah. another episode. But maybe maybe uh, Gavin, you'd be kind enough to pray for us. I'd love to. (laughs) Father, thank you. Thank you so much for the gift of this new day and for time. Uh, Lord, thank you for the privileges you've given us. We are so privileged. You've given us your holy word. You've given us one another. You constantly lavish upon us the Holy Spirit. We pray for the gifts of the Spirit today for all of us. Everyone's listening. Lord, we pray too that where you've touched our hearts, they may be opened under your loving care we pray for your church you'll defend it and help it we pray lord for the gift to bring your saving words to people who otherwise may end up in hell a long way from you Mm. and we ask you constantly allow us the grace to keep the humility that that we deserve to have and to receive from you all that you want to tell us and do us and go in the way you direct us to you alone O lord be praise and glory, honour, might to now and for all eternity. Amen. Mm.